get into the self-defense stuff, what we have to look at is we go all the way back to self-defense of the person, and then we've got to talk about self-defense of a, a third person, then we've got to talk about self-defense of property, and then we have to talk about self-defense of a third person's property. And the reason we do is because each one of those is stacked. In other words, when you get down to the bottom, it says C above. When you get to number three, it says C1 and two. When you get to number two, it says C number one. Well, let me throw this in. You said you don't know of any prosecuting attorney that would want to do this case. What if one said, you know, I want to do it? Well, then it opens up the door. So let's pretend like we've got somebody who wants to prosecute. And what, what kind of angles would he come on you at? Well, what, what he can do is present to the jury or the grand jury. If the, and if the grand jury would probably no bill you, but if they went ahead and, and true billed you and you had to go to a jury trial, all they have to do is show that you shot someone and accuse you of murder. Mm -hmm. So then you would have to admit to, yes, I did shoot someone, but it was in self-defense or it was in protection of someone else's person or my property or someone else's property. And there are very specific laws on that, but some of the stuff that really gets sticky and each one of these words means something, but it does mean something different to different people. And that's why you have 12 people on a jury, is because all 12 people have to agree that you are guilty of a crime or that your defense of self-defense is unjustified. Okay. And what, uh, what you're looking at there is a person, and I'm going to read this, in the, it's in the Penal Code, Section 9.31a. A person is justified in using deadly force against another when and to the degree the actor reasonably believes. See, the actor reasonably believes the deadly force is imminently, that's another big word, necessary. But the key word is reasonably, right? Well, the reasonably believes, yes. If the actor reasonably believes the deadly force is imminently necessary to protect the actor against the other's use or attempted use of unlawfully deadly force. So... The situation you described, you know, the fellow had a pistol. We knew he had a pistol. We know that he was in commission of a robbery, and, and we're going to get deeper into this here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But all these things come into play about what is reasonable and what is immediately necessary. I mean, as the guy is leaving, maybe he's uh, stepped through the door already and jumping in a car. Maybe that's a little bit far out, but if he's still just walking in the store, walking towards the door, he still has the pistol in his hand. And uh, we know he's a bad actor, and we know he holds guns to people's head, and we know he's a robber. All those things make him a threat, and it may be immediately necessary to use deadly force against him. But the key is if the actor believes that. And you, I would definitely believe that actor believed it, for sure. Well, yeah, I would too, uh, and I think most, of the, most all the district attorneys I know would believe that too. Ross one time said, and Trey, you probably remember this, he said, it's going to sound weird what I'm about to say is, but don't hesitate. So what was happening was the person who I'm talking about was second guessing himself saying, I wanted to do this, but I don't know if I could have. So here you're worried about laws again, whereas you're in this situation and you feel like you're threatened. It's, the bottom line is get out of the threat because you believe and perceive you're in danger. You, you perceive and believe that your life's um, being threatened. You believe that your property's being taken, and so just get the job done or don't do it. Don't second-guess yourself, right? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, the other side of that coin, Matt, may be that if you're sitting there second-guessing yourself, then there's not an immediate threat. That's possible. Now, I think a lot of people second-guess themselves because they don't want the deal of the law coming down on them. Well, but if you have time to second-guess yourself and you have time to think about, well, I, and it's funny that uh, y'all were talking about someone coming into the house and sitting on the couch. I, I literally woke up one morning and uh, there was a fellow drinking some wine that he had gotten out of my refrigerator as he sat on the couch. <laughs> wow, really? <laughs> and, anyway, uh, he just happened to come in the wrong family, place. Was it? It, okay. it was an apartment complex and he was looking, looking for a young lady that lived in a door very similar to mine across the pool. You know, I make that joke quite often when I'm passing by an apartment complex and all the doors look the same. I say, yeah. hey, don't be drunk when you go home. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be going to the wrong house. He was super drunk. It was pretty obvious. Yeah. So what was your composure on that? Well, I, I just, uh, you know, I had my gun and uh, I was pointing it at him and I felt in control. I didn't feel like there was any immediate threat of anything because he was just drunk. Here, cheers. <laughs>
He offered me some wine, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was nice of him. <laughs> anyway, back to what we were talking about. Um, you know, it's it's again, it, it has to do with the prosecutor presenting his evidence and you then asserting the self defense by admitting to his evidence, but then letting the jury decide whether your evidence has any credibility. And if there's a reasonable doubt as to whether or not you are innocent, in other words, that you should be acquitted, and if there's a reasonable doubt that, that, uh, that you should not have acted in self-defense. And I'm, see, what I'm trying to say is that the prosecutor does have the burden here, but you do have to admit to that burden initially, but then when you raise the other, there's still the prosecutor's burden to dissuade the jury that you did not act reasonably and immediately. Gotcha. Yeah. So when you get down to it, there's a whole lot of stuff that gets put into what they call a charge. The judge makes the charge with the help of the lawyers involved in the case, and that judge may or may not uh, let certain parts in, and if they don't let parts in that the defendant asks for, uh, then it can be reversed and have a new trial. If they do let those parts in and the jury answers affirmatively uh, in such a fashion that you are found guilty, then you're guilty as charged. So all that uh, self-defense stuff <clears throat> gets pretty tricky when you start getting into the courthouse. I asked a handful of people the question of if somebody did what this individual did in the store, pointed the gun, had the gun to the head, and you shot him, basically why he was facing you, everybody said, absolutely no, you know, no problems at all. I asked the same question, but changed the one bit of if he, the, the robbery was done and the guy's trying to run out of the store and you shoot him in the back, then the person goes, they hesitate. They go, I don't know. I, I'd still let the guy go because, you know, he was threatening all this kind of stuff, but they start to hesitate because I don't know, was the threat over, so on and so forth. And the reason I bring that up here is because if you have a handful of people and me asking that question, what are you going to get in the courtroom if it ever did go to trial? And these people say, well, he was being robbed, but then the guy was running out the store, and the guy, the store owner, shot him in the back five times because he was in fear for his life and wanted to get his property back. It, it, it muddle, muddies the water a little bit. In the, a person's mind who may not be as um, understanding of situations like that. Right. Yeah. But when you look at the law, though, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, depends on the person who's acting, uh, their state of mind. So all the stuff you described about holding the gun to his head as he pushed the head down and taking the property, uh, you know, that, that would put into uh, my mind uh, a pretty good fear of my person. And then also there's the property that he's walking out with. So deadly force can be used to protect property. And we have section 909.42 of the uh, penal code that talks about person is justified using deadly force against another to protect land or tangible mover property. There was a case where uh, uh, the court found that a defendant was not entitled to a jury charge on defense of property to justify retrieving by gunpoint money spent on cocaine after the defendant discovered the substance was not in fact cocaine. I mean, can you believe it? Here's the guy wanting to uh, put his defense up that, oh man, I was justified because they were taking my money. They didn't give me the cocaine. <laughs> but but 9.42 says that we can use that if uh, we'd be justified by using force against another under the sections above and and when and to the degree he reasonably believes the deadly force is immediately necessary. And then we have three parts that are joined. No, two parts that are joined by or. One is to prevent the other's immediate commission of arson, burglary, robbery, aggravated robbery, theft during the nighttime, or criminal mischief during the nighttime. So you see, that's the one that nails him. He is committing an aggravated robbery. So the shooter reasonably believes that deadly force is eminently necessary to prevent the aggravated robbery. So he's in the clear. If he runs out the door and shoots him through the car window, he can rely on that one and be in the clear. That makes you go to sleep easier, doesn't it? Well, it should. <laughs> then it's connected with the or. In other words, you don't have the first one. You could have the second one. Says no, it is, Rick. I'm a reasonable guy, okay? 
I, I don't raise these questions. The thing is, because I'm in this position of doing radio and doing studying and doing my classwork and training, I see all the problems that come up, especially talking to you guys and being in the legal system. You, you see how things can get muddled and turned around to a poor guy or gal who's trying to defend themselves, and they got to go through the ringer before they can come out and say, yeah, they were justified in doing what they're doing. Well, this pretty much clarifies it here, doesn't it? I mean, and let's go, go to B, part B, which is the or. So, reasoning, starting out with the reason to believe the deadly force is immediately necessary to, and then the second one is to prevent the other who is fleeing immediately after the committing the burglary, robbery, aggravated robbery, or theft during the nighttime from escaping with the property. Mm -hmm. And, then we got an and, he reason believes that the land or property cannot be protected or recovered by any of the means, or the use of force other than deadly force to protect or recover the land or property would expose the actor or another to a substantial <coughs> risk of death or serious bodily injury. Now that part two of that AB was connected with the or. So the fact that the fella I was talking about who had a gun to his head, I believe it would be reasonable to believe that any other way of trying to get that money back would expose you to deadly mm -hmm. force from the bad guy. Serious risk of injury, I yeah. would call that. Yeah, pretty you, you for sure are a master at the law. I study this particular part of the law a lot, and it's obvious why. There's a lot of people out there who have guns and licenses that don't. They just sign the affidavit saying they do know it, but they don't study it. So that's why there's so much uh, question or hesitation or doubt, or they get themselves in a lot more trouble than they should because they don't know it. So this is very good clarification. Ladies and gentlemen, please listen. If you have a story, you can call anonymously. If you're a guy, say you're Joe. If you're a girl, say you're Jane. And uh, But if your name is Joe or Jane, then <laughs> Jane is just something else, okay? But uh, if you got a story, a situation has happened, Relay it over the radio here. Let's let's talk about it. We'll do a true story in real life, and we'll dissect it and see it and talk about it. So give us a call here, 254-697-6633, and uh, be part of the show. We'd love to hear what you got to say. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I was going to say that there's another section that talks about protection of third party's property. And, you know, if you're an employee working in a place, you inherently uh, are in possession of that property. In other words, you have the right to protect it as if it were your own. But with regard to a third party's property, uh, it talks about you can use deadly force against another to protect land or tangible, movable property of a third person if under the circumstances you believe that the actor would be justified and those above in using force to protect his own land and you, the actor, reasonably believe that the unlawful interference constitutes attempted or consummated theft of or criminal mischief to the tangible move or property, there's, or there's one in there. I'm going to raise a question. I'll go ahead. Sure. Or the actor reasonably believes the third person has requested his right protection right of the there. land, which you know all employees pretty much have that, and you know stepfathers, stepmothers. Yeah, uh, but if you if there's a lot of cases I read in the paper or articles that the store clerk had a gun on him, defended himself and his fellow crew, and then gets suspended or fired because it was against policy. Isn't that a stab in the back? Well, policy, policy. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, these policies are made for good reason. And, uh, you know, human factors experts talk about what can and can't happen in situations. So you could potentially expose your fellow workers to more danger by pulling out a gun when you shouldn't. So we don't know all the facts about what happens in initial situations. But these policies can be made across the board in order to protect people not necessarily get them in danger. So whether or not uh, you should or shouldn't pull a gun, I think you should listen to policy, but under certain circumstances, uh, hey, like the one we you just described, I think it's reasonable to go ahead and take care of business on that. But let me go ahead and finish with this. Uh, P, B, which is pretty uh, reasonable, it says if you have a legal duty to protect the third person's land or property, and this is a good one, or the third person's who land or property he uses uh, who he uses force or deadly force to protect is his spouse, his property, his parents, or his children's property, or someone who resides with the actor or is under the actor's care. So those things, uh, in other words, you have the inherent right to protect that person's property. All right, Trey, let's take this call. Let's see who we got. Go ahead. Welcome to the show. This is Aaron's High Cap Adventure Radio Program. Who we got on the line? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Hey, Jane. Uh, James, how you doing? Hey, uh... His real name is Joe, by the way. Ago, 
Huh? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, a few years ago, my son's vehicle got stolen and all the tools in it. I turned around and took chase. He, the guy was an expert car racer, let me tell you. <laughs> he left me behind. But I called on 911 and gave them the direction of the law in which direction they were going. And nothing, to me, I don't believe they even cared. I don't think they sent out no roadblocks because the roads I went, I never met a law. I told them, and I was getting mad because we were, everyone worked hard for what they had. And I made the comment, look, I'm telling you where he's going. If, and I'm in pursuit. If you don't catch him and I catch him, I will shoot him. I almost went to prison over that. Now, that's pretty sorry. Yet y'all saying you have the right to shoot for your own property. So that's, my question is, why was I told that when I'm trying to recover the property? James, property. at what point did you get to where they actually said that to you? Uh, when I was giving um, um, the directions where he went, and I finally said, look, I, y'all aren't sending anyone out. I'm on my own. So if I catch him, I will kill him. Okay, so they told you this via the phone and uh, said if you do that, you'll get in trouble, so on and so forth? All right. Okay. Well, you could be arrested. The question then would be, would you be charged? Would you be no bail by a jury? And then if you had a jury trial, would you be convicted? Uh, some of the stuff here talks about imminent threat and talks about being able to recover the property. See, here we have a theft at nighttime, right? Uh, this was uh, late in the evening. Okay, well, the question might be whether it was nighttime or not because theft at nighttime is a special... Uh, uh, category. Was it a burglary? Did they break into uh, a home or an adjacent building? They stole a vehicle and took all the tools. Okay, so if it were theft at nighttime, you would have the right to use deadly force in order to recover the equipment if there were no other reasonable way to recover it. And your story about the police not reacting, I think, would be some evidence that there was no other reasonable way. Hey, like them apples. <laughs> Speaking of apples, later on in the show. So, so you might be a witness, you know, for somebody who gets in that sort of situation. Like, hey, there was no other reasonable way because the police weren't reacting. Hey, James, stay on the line for a second. But Rick, what about that comment I was making to you about okay. fresh pursuit? How does that come into play? Because it's well, there's somewhere in the I can't I can't quote which one it is, but somewhere in these uh, penal codes it says. And, um, under under, under protection of property, section 9.41B, it talks about how uh, necessary to recover the property if the actor uses the force immediately or in fresh pursuit after the disposition and, and then the rest of it stuff believes that there's no uh, claim had by the person who's sealing it or the other accomplished the disposition by force, threat, or fraud against the actor. So fraud, I think, pretty much covers theft. So he's in fresh pursuit in a vehicle. How far would we say that goes until... Well, it's a question of fact. What does fresh mean? You know, fresh as far as being um, in traffic going five miles an hour that might last, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes might not be fresh. We're on a country gravel road going 60 or 80. It might last 30 minutes to an hour. I mean, you know, what is reasonable? What is fresh? Uh, those are questions of fact. There's no, there's no bright line on that, James. What was the final outcome of that story there, James? Uh, well, the vehicle was finally recovered, but everything was gone. All the tools and all, the vehicle was, I would say, thrashed. I mean, it was fixable, but, you know, you have to go through the insurance and get everything fixed. Uh, but, well, I would, uh, I would say, uh, to answer your initial question, and that is, yeah, you could, an officer can always arrest you. It's just a matter of, will you be convicted of the arrest? So they may have been saying that over the phone just as a, uh, a cover blanket to maybe slow you down or not get you involved with the person. And if it actually did happen, um, they'll do what they've got to do. You might possibly get arrested and released and all this kind of stuff to go to trial later or, or what have you. But in something like that, based on what I know and from what I'm hearing Rick saying is it shouldn't be a, a problem. It shouldn't be because you can use deadly force to protect 
your children's property, and that's part of the part of the section. Even though that was during the day, uh, late evening. Well, again, I like I clarified a while ago, it might be a question of fact whether that was nighttime or not. Okay. Now explain the difference right. if it's during the daytime. Well, that uh, talks about a theft during the nighttime under section 9.42. It to prevent the other's imminent commission of arson, burglary, robbery, aggravated robbery, theft during nighttime, or criminal mischief during the nighttime. See, arson, burglary, robbery, and of course aggravated robbery means they were using a pistol or some, some knife or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can do that during the daytime, but just the theft has to be during the nighttime or criminal mischief, like somebody's throwing a brick through your window. Can you explain why? I know why, but can you explain in a manner that's clear and simple as to why there's the difference between the two? Well, because nighttime is... Uh, it raises the, the risk. Yeah, yeah, it raises the risk and because people are lurking around out there stealing right. stuff at nighttime. All right, James, I hope we I mean, answered I, your question. I don't, I, don't, I don't really understand the big difference, but apparently there is one. And, you know, when you start talking about the twilight hours, uh, I assume the weatherman knows what time it gets night. I don't know. Well, the paper you have in front of us are the rules of the game. So if we don't play by the rules, we get in trouble. So that's why we got to know the rules so we can stay within the boundaries of the rules and not get in much trouble if at all. They did ask me, though, if I had a gun, and of course I did. And you're well trained, right? You came to my my range and my courses and did a lot of practice, right? <laughs> Well, Saturday, next Saturday, 2 o'clock. I'll see you there, James. <laughs> you ought to. And, you know, James, I think what happened... Uh, I'm sorry, sir, say again. A warrior course is that exactly? I'm in Cameron. If you go to aaronsgunshop.com, you can check it out. I, I don't really have the time right now to explain it, but you can call me up later, I can okay. tell you. It's out in the country. You can find it. No problem. All right, James. Thanks a lot for the call. If anybody else has got a call, please give us a call. That was a great story, great learning tool. So, um, Rick, why don't you keep going? Maybe somebody else will call up with something else. Well, that's really about it. When you start talking about protecting your property and protecting your uh, your other people's property, but also they've got a, a clause in there. If somebody breaks into your habitation, you don't have to ask a lot of questions. You can shoot because... Uh, that is uh, a, an immediate threat. If somebody's burglarizing your habitation, which basically means they're coming into your home without uh, permission. Uh, you know, like a lot of times people say get out and they won't get out. Well, does, would that include the story of you with the wine guy? Yeah. Okay, yeah. now why didn't you shoot? I didn't want to get blood all over my yeah. couch. Too many leave practice. I mean, you know, it just seemed like he was a big threat. Uh, yeah, because I know your demeanor, okay? You're kind of <laughs> calm, cool, and collected. Me, on the other hand, I take control. Not that you don't. I'm a more aggressive, take control of the situation. Yeah, you'd have been up all night cleaning up blood. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. Because in my class, I'm telling you, the more <laughs> trained you are, the more options you have, the more time you have. The more time you have, the more options you have. So the better skilled at arms you are, um, the better mindset that you have, you, you're able to make better decisions. So if somebody breaks into my house, since I do have that skill level, I'll say uh, comply or die, you know, as yeah. opposed to. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I felt pretty confident. I had the gun in my hand pointed at his head. I had practiced enough where I could have dotted the eye if I needed to. So, uh, you know, if he had whipped something out, I could have popped him. Uh, I didn't really want to, though. I didn't feel like he was there to do that. Yeah, I got, I got leather. I don't know if that's good for leather. but we'll, see. well okay. let me tell you a, a quick story about some of the cases here. Here's one where the defendant claimed that while he was discussing the matter with uh, the, uh, the decedent, his son, armed with a rifle, appeared around the corner of the barn in a shooting position and immediately fired, whereupon the defendant shot him. Okay, so here we have a, a young man who gets shot by a defendant who's in court. Okay, so the decedent was, did not have a right to reference to the property in question property in question was in the right of his father and he had no right to assault the defendant unless necessary to save his father's life and the court should have charged that if the decedent made an attack on defendant as claimed not in defense of his father the decedent from his standpoint through his life was endangered he could shoot the decedent in self-defense 
So this is sort of a switch on things. In other words, did the decedent have the right to self-defense? Did the decedent have the right to protect the property? And the question, if a jury answered no to that, then the shooter had the right to self-defense because here was someone coming around the corner to shoot him. Wow. So it does get complex sometimes. What you know? determines what kind of case law goes into the books that you study? Uh, generally, appellant. And the highest uh, appellant court in Texas is the Court of Criminal Appeals. Now, we do go to the Court of Appeals first with these uh, cases. And then when those cases are uh, either affirmed or not affirmed, either side can appeal on up to the next court. And those courts, the high courts like the Supreme Court of Texas, <coughs> Court of Criminal Appeals, they have the right to review or not review. And if they don't review it, then we have to rely on the appellant court. So, for instance, the one I just talked about was a uh, Texas Criminal Court of Appeals. So it was the high court in Texas. If you go to a court like that and have a, um, a case resolved using some of this case law, does that case get into the book or it doesn't because you utilize some of the cases in this book to solve that case? That well, of course, sense? now we don't really use books at all. It's online. And all of those cases, yes, they, they get reported. Some uh, say they're not published, but they're still there. We sometimes <laughs> use unpublished opinions <coughs> as authority in front of a, ju a judge. Uh, and sometimes, you know, if, if the other person has a, a Supreme Court case that goes against my Court of Appeals case, then guess who wins? Not me. How, so, does, how does an opinion come into play? How, how does that work? I, well, the judge looks at this. In other words, here we are in court, and I'm defending a man who shot someone who came around the corner supposedly to protect property when in fact that person did not have authority to protect the property it was someone else's authority mm -hmm. so I had the right to self-defense so then the charge that the judge gives to the jury because it's the court's charge will ask certain questions and if those questions are not in there that I've asked for and I've objected to the charge as he's that the judge is presenting it then I have what we call preserved error. So then when I appeal the case, if my client is convicted, then I have an opportunity there for the Court of Appeals to overturn that conviction and I get another trial. Wow. Whereupon I might be able then to get the new judge or the old judge who made the mistake to put the correct stuff in the charge so that if the jury answers, well, yeah, there was not a right to self-defense for the deceased, then my guy may be acquitted. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so impressed with these guys. Uh, Ross and, and Rick because they retain in their brains and ask a question, bam, it comes out, this information. It's incredible. Rick, tell everybody how they can get a hold of you because we're just about out of time here. Well, certainly you can uh, contact us at respectforyou.com. I do civil law, and one thing that I need you to understand about that is all of these rules that have to do with criminal law also apply to civil law. In other words, if you do something wrong, if you do something that might not be criminal, but it's still negligent or uh, negligent homicide or something like that, you can still be held responsible for damages in a civil sense. The uh, only difference would be that the burden of proof for a civil matter is preponderance of the evidence, whereas in a criminal it's beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a higher burden of proof for the prosecutor in a criminal case. And the reason is, is because you have your freedom at risk. In other words, that's right, right. the most valuable thing where, you know, property is not all that valuable compared to your freedom. So criminals, prison time, civil is finance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So respect for you.com is where I'm at. If you've been wronged, hurt, harmed by someone else, give us a call. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with regard to, uh, uh asbestos cancers right now. I'm working on, uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma with regard to roundup exposure. We do a fair amount of truck wrecks. Again, respect for you.com. Rick, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on. Glad to be here.